Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmen Lita Chief, and I'm a Senior Research Coordinator with the Center for Health Equity Research and the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. And I just wanna take some time to, to thank you very genuinely for showing up for today's talk, which is the Fairness First X talk. And this is the first in our spring 2023 series. And we're very pleased and delighted to have Dr. Amanda Hunter with us, who will be talking about healing through culture, my journey with cultural identity and mental health in graduate school. But before we jump into her talk, I do want to give just a brief primer overview about what is the Fairness First X talk. Um, it's really a component of the community engagement core uh, within the um, Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative effort, or SHRC for short. And these are virtual conversations with health equity funded sponsors or funded researchers and advocates about how research can support the well being of our communities here in the southwestern United States. It really is a place for um, first just to, to be a to be to be delivered at a conversational um, comfortable space and cadence and so it's a place for connection for collective learning and also to really um, get at satiating some of the curiosities that um, are abound around health equity, what that is, what are issues of health equity, and things of that nature. Very briefly about SHRC. Um, SHRC is under the umbrella of a larger center, and you'll see that Center for Health Equity Research in the right-hand um, photo, that beautiful building there. Um, SHRC is under that umbrella, and it is funded by the National Institutes for Health. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a photo of uh, a lot of the folks who do work over at SHRC. We do have a few grounding community agreements that we would like everyone to um, agree to. The first of which is to keep your camera on if possible. And we know that um, especially here in Flagstaff, we just had a storm pass through. So we understand if you're not able to keep it on um, because of bandwidth or any other interruptions that might happen to your um, internet connection. But if possible, please keep your camera on. We feel like it really strengthens, strengthens the engagement that we have with our speaker. The second one is to please stay muted during the talk. There are gonna be some opportunities where our guest speaker will prompt everyone to share in discussion. And at that time, you can unmute yourselves, but for the most part, please stay muted during the presentation to minimize disruptions. And then the last one is to please stay engaged in the conversation and participate during um, our question and answer session, which will happen about, um, about uh, 11, wait, 12.30 PM. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Amanda, and let's give her a round of applause, whether that's in your reactions or um, behind the screen. Without further ado, here's Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. See the little clap hands going. So <laughs> uh, first, I just wanted to get a feel for who we have today in the virtual audience. So just wanted you all to maybe take a second to write in the chat uh, where you're joining us from. Pull the chat up. Who saw? My sister is here. <laughs> Phoenix. Ooh, the art building right next door, all my, my colleagues here in my pod. <laughs> Flag, of course. <laughs> awesome, Rough Rock, SBS West, ARD, Applied Research and Development Building here. Awesome. Old Maine, great. Well, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> um, it's great to be here today um, to be chatting with you all. 
Um, Leo Senchiman Yavo, my name is Amanda Hunter. I'm a member of the Paspoyaki tribe. Um, this is kind of my life, just like in a slide. Um, I was born and raised in Tucson, on the, out, on the outskirts of Tucson, really, um, in a community called Picture Rocks. This picture up here on the left is uh, the street where my sisters and I <laughs> grew up. Our house is kind of on the, on the left of this little white fence here. But um, I'm a multiracial. My mom's side of the family is of Irish descent. These are my grandparents. And uh, through my dad's side of the family, I'm UMA and Mexican. And these are my, my nana and tata over here in this corner. Um, I'm a citizen of the Paspoyaki tribe. Um, and my identity has really been shaped by growing up in Tucson and by my family. I have four sisters who I love dearly. Like um, I just mentioned, my sister's on the call today. She was on the call 15 minutes early. So <laughs> um, we're all about a year apart. And so I'm really living, living the auntie life. These are all my nieces and nephews here on the right, um, all eight of them. And so I love them, love them to death. And so that's kind of just part of what makes me who I am today on this slide. Um, and I think, you know, it just have really supported my decisions and everything that's happened um, in my life up to this point. And so um, just kind of wanted to start out with a little bit kind of branching off of that is, is my pathway to public health. Um, and, you know, where I am today, <laughs> I, I honestly like, you know, I, I kind of laugh about it. I feel like it's due to all of the fail failures I've experienced. Um, I don't really think of them as failures now. Uh, I really think of them as, you know, like redirections or signs to signs to refocus. Um, but I knew I was going to go to college while I was in high school. Um, you know, I was kind of nerdy like that. But <laughs> my, uh, my parents were hard workers. This is my, my mom and dad here. Um, they had four kids that were all a year apart before they were 21. And these are me and my sisters back in the day. We were trying to dress up fancy. And so we put socks on our hands and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but both of my parents started going to school while we were really young. Um, my dad actually graduated from law school when I graduated from high school. And my mom went to school to become a radiology physician's assistant and she graduated when I was getting or graduating with my bachelor's degree and so you know just all growing up I, that huge value was instilled in me was the importance of not giving up you know I saw slowly how education changed their lives for the better um, I saw them staying up late um, at, at night to study um, studying all weekend um, all of that that we, we know about as, as students, you know, the blood, sweat and tears and stress <laughs> um, were ha really had, you know, by all. And so just seeing them go through that was really, I think it made an impression on me. And so, um, you know, while I was in high school, I, I thought I wanted to go um, to medical school. I, I watched a lot of Dr. G medical examiner. I don't know if anybody has ever seen that show. Um, but I thought it would be so cool to solve these like puzzles every day, basically, and help people and families find closure. Um, I was also really fascinated by how the body kind of breaks down in general. Um, and so as an undergraduate, I, at the University of Arizona, I took pre-med classes and I worked in the orthopedic research lab, um, doing research on, um, on osteoarthritis. And so uh, I spent four years in that lab and it really, really helped me develop a, a love for research and asking questions. Um, but I almost, you know, I almost didn't get in. I almost didn't start that process. I applied for a summer research program and I didn't get in. Um, I thought that was it. I was, you know, pretty devastated because at the time I was just that fresh out of high school and hadn't really experienced much failure up to that point except for, you know, the occasional bad grade on math tests. And so, you know, I don't know, like, if I would have tried to get into research again after that happened. Um, you know, I just don't know. But uh, lucky for me, uh, there was a man in the audience named Dr. John Sivek who saw a presentation that I gave at a summer program for high school students. 
And I guess he liked my presentation. So he advocated for me with the research program that I didn't get into and asked if I could join his lab. And so they, you know, let me in that way. <laughs> um, I ended up working there for four years, as, as I mentioned. Um, you know, by the end of that time, I was developing my own like mini kind of research studies, training other undergraduate students who were coming in. Um, and I also decided that I really didn't want to go to medical school at that time. I wanted to do research. I was really in love with that. So I applied for two jobs uh, um, at research facilities in Tucson, and I didn't get either of them. <laughs> and again, I was devastated. Um, I lost my confidence and I stopped applying after that. Um, and little did I know that you really need to, uh, to apply uh, for many, many jobs <laughs> to find one that sticks, especially, you know, fresh out of, out of undergraduate. Um, so I started um, after that, you know, I started working at a doctor's office, doing medical records and as a pharmacy tech for Walgreens, I was working these two jobs and I did that for two years, and over that time, I, I really started to feel overwhelmed with the medical system. Um, you know, I would see patients come into the doctor's office and leave 10 minutes later with a new prescription, only to come back in, you know, with the same problem in the, in the next few weeks. Um, and as a pharmacy tech, I would see patients with long, long lists of medications, and oftentimes they wouldn't know what half of the medications were for or who prescribed them. <clears throat> and so I started wondering, um, like, what are we doing in this country or in the state to prevent people from being in this position situation in the first place? And so uh, I literally Googled <laughs> health promotion, disease prevention, or something like that. And um, it led me to the University of Arizona's College of Public Health. And so I applied and, you know, the, here I am today. <laughs> um, and so this is me in the orthopedic research lab. This was a staged photo, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh, got my uh, MPH and my PhD, both from the College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. Um, and that's kind of when my, my research, uh, my path that I'm on right now kind of started to take, take shape. Uh, starting grad school was really hard for me. I, you know, had taken two years off, uh, two years to work. So I wasn't, you know, in school. I wasn't in that groove of studying yet. Um, that, you know, that, that extra amount of, of, uh, drive that it takes for, for graduate school, you know, you get started in school, you set up like those practices that kind of work for you, uh, for studying, for working, hanging out with your friends and your family. Um, so I didn't really have that yet. Um, I also moved back in with my parents in Picture Rock. So that was, you know, an hour drive away from the university and from my work. And I was still working my off-campus job at the doctor's office. Um, and I also, I, I, you know, I moved out of my parents' house right after high school. And so moving back in with them and also, you know, my sister, my cousin, and one of my nieces who's in this picture here, I call her my roommate. <laughs> um, that's us eating breakfast, but, um, you know, moved back in. So it was just like going from having my own, my own kind of space and, and living in, on my own, you know, kind of supporting myself. Um, moving back in to home, I was sleeping on one of those little toddler beds, you know, my feet kind of hanging off, um, the toy box, you know, blocking the door from opening all the way. And so it's just kind of like a big change. Um, I was also kind of getting out of a, a relationship that wasn't so great. And so it was just kind of a, a recipe for disaster. There was just too many, this is me right here, this is live depiction. <laughs> Um, I was very, very unbalanced and I, you know, became depressed and I, you know, this, I'm not, hopefully this isn't TMI, but I, you know, would start crying like in the middle of class while on the treadmill at the gym at work. Um, I'd, you know, find a place to park after classes so I could wait until my family was asleep because I didn't want to come home and then have them see me crying, walking in the door. Um, and, you know, it's just, it was hard to sleep. I was so exhausted. And so I found myself like, you know, falling asleep, like in the car while I was driving and in class. 
And so that first semester, that first semester and a half of graduate school were really tough. <laughs> um, and so it was that, that second semester when I started to reach out. And I joined an indigenous health student group at the, on campus. This is a picture of us. I think Jenny's right here. I think she's here today, but. <laughs> um, and that, you know, really encouraged me to spend time with other indigenous students. Uh, we did things like volunteering with the Tucson Indian Center, you know, doing social activities um, that got us together in, like in a positive way. This is at our, our Christmas party. Um, I also started on my own, like taking language classes, um, attending and language classes at the, um, on the Pascuaki Res, um, attending and learning more about like community ceremonies, um, you know, and, and learning about like the ceremonies over time. And so I started to feel like I was like regaining that sense of balance. Um, I truly felt like that cultural connection, you know, whether it was uh, with my community or with other indigenous students, it really brought me back into balance. And at the same time uh, that I was healing, going through that process, I started my master's internship project. And uh, one of my long-term mentors is uh, Dr. Nikki Tufel-Shown. Um, she sent out an email asking if any students wanted to take on this internship project. And, you know, I didn't even read the project, um, but I knew I wanted to work with Dr. Tufel Schoen because of all, all her work that she's done as an ally in indigenous communities. Um, and also I got a B in her class during that phase of depression during my first semester. And so I was like, <laughs> trying to, you know, get back into her good graces. <laughs> um, but it turns out the project was with the Boys and Girls Club and the Wallapai community. Um, the club director at the time, um, Nakia Johnson, who's non-native, um, and uh, the director of Native Services, Tamara Little Salt Butler, um, recognized that there that the club in this community really needed a cultural program, and so my internship project was to work with the community to develop an after-school program that combined the Boys and Girls Club structure with the local cultural values and activities, and um, the kids ended up calling this program Native Spirit. I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple slides. <laughs> um, I see we have some, oh, okay, some comments in the chat. I, um, I'll look at those in a little bit later, but if anybody has any questions, just, yeah, let me know. Um, so that's kind of how I came into this research. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background kind of stats and research on the relationship between cultural connection and determinants of health. Um, so data, data from the Indian Health Service shows that, um, you know, we're dealing with some major health equity issues that lead to health disparities. And I didn't wanna make a list of, of all the stats. Um, I think there might be, you know, some of us that are familiar with the trends, but, uh, briefly, for anyone who doesn't, um, indigenous people in the U.S. have the highest rates of suicide and high rates of overdose and alcohol-related deaths. And uh, some studies have shown that alcohol and other drug use begins for indigenous youth at younger ages and at higher rates. And so, you know, starting to use uh, substances at a younger age really makes a person more susceptible to addiction and mental illness over the long term. Um, but the good news is that there are a lot of people working to find solutions to find to these health disparities. Um, you know, people in communities, researchers at universities, uh, indigenous organizations, grassroots organizations, um, and research has identified that cultural connection has a positive impact on individuals and communities. And so although this seems like a fairly new area kind of in the research world, as indigenous people, we know this to be true, you know, without all the studies. And so that's just a little bit of background about how my, re my research relates to uh, some health disparities. Um, I didn't make this figure, I copy and pasted it. <laughs> and I have, a, um, it's from um, an uh, organization out of Canada that are doing a lot of really great work on identifying um, determinants of indigenous people's health. Um, and so we can't talk about, uh, you know, health disparities without pointing out how we got here in the first place. 
And so in public health, we talk a lot about the social determinants of health. And um, for those who might not be familiar, um, it's, those are the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, play, worship, and age um, that impact our health. And so, you know, as public health students and professionals, we could probably recite that in our sleep. <laughs> but um, I'd like to make, you know, the connection to indigenous determinants of health as well. Um, and I, I chose this figure because I think it does a really great job in reiterating the connection between uh, root causes of health disparities that we see today, um, including colonization. And I think that kind of fits better with the, pro the project that I'm working on. And so, um, you know, you see this tree and there's the roots of the tree and like the roots of a tree, um, the, the bottom says root determinants. So those include things like colonial ideologies. Um, these are deeply embedded uh, structural determinants of health. Um, they represent the foundations from which all of these other determinants evolve and are maintained. Um, they have the most profound influence on the health of populations. And, you know, just like the kind of uh, health disparities that we see up here in the roots that are something that's like, you know, shown years later, um, inequities in human health are frequently generated and maintained through these like socially configured structures or, or roots of, that are deep in our systems. Um, here in the middle is there are the core determinants. It's like you're the core of your tree. Um, and we could, you know, think of those as like the, the, pre, the precursors or the beginnings of the stem determinants. Um, they might have a less direct impact on the health of individuals, but they still have this profound influence on the conditions in which we're born, live, work, play. Um, and for indigenous people, uh, the stem determinants such as, you know, like low income, um, unfavorable living conditions are often, you know, a result from a lack of local infrastructure, resources, and you know, capacity. And then finally, our you know, most visible link to health, which are the STEM determinants, and those are also you know, what we know as the social determinants of health. Um, so beyond you know, reducing the capacity to meet our basic survival needs, like adequate food, shelter, um, safety, um, these kind of unfavorable STEM determinants also contribute to acute stress, um, that, you know, exacerbates any health issues that might already be present. And so I'd say that my research really focuses on that connection between cultural resurgence um, through a community program and health of individuals. And so that's kind of where my focus is at right now. And then just to kind of build off of that a little bit more and to give you a little bit more background about the Native Spirit program, uh, Native Spirit is a 10 session after school program. Um, each session is led by a local cultural knowledge holder and each session focuses on a different cultural value and activity that's identified by the community. And so not only do we view this program as um, something that addresses determinants of health, it's also um, you know, a way to begin to address health equity issues in the community. And so, you know, what is health equity? Um, it's that idea that everyone should have resources necessary to access their full health potential, whatever that might be. And so, you know, indigenous peoples in the US have experienced historical and contemporary attempts to eradicate indigenous identity and attempts at genocide. And so, you know, they thinking about the tree, they tried to chop down the tree at the core and really kind of poison those roots. And so this means that in indigenous people cannot access our full health potential um, and have those strong flourishing stems and leaves. Um, so we, we need our cultures, our cultural values and cultural connection to survive and thrive in balance. Um, and without that, we have seen increases in health disparities like substance use that I mentioned and other mental health conditions. And so the Native Spirit Program really works at several layers and systems levels to heal that chopped area of the core and remove, you know, the poison from the roots um, in order to be able to reach our full health potential. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of background. Um, oops. I just have a quick question. Um, and just for timing, I think I might 
pop this up, but um, how does your culture help you maintain balance? Anybody wants to put in the chat? I feel like that could be like a um, essay question. <laughs> um, and even if we don't go over it right now, I feel, um, you know, just maybe if you could think about that on your own time, or if you do want to put it in the chat, you know, while I'm talking, um, that'd be great. I feel like it's always good to talk, to talk about that with people. Um, and so that's something to kind of think about. Um, moving forward, I do want to talk um, a little bit more about my pro the project um, that was funded by um, the Shirk um, Pilot Project Program. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, much of my journey and my research to this day is um, couldn't, couldn't have been done alone. Um, I've had academic and community mentors who have advocated for me along the way. Um, my community partners for this shirk supported projects are the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Um, in 2018, Tamara Little Salt Butler, who I think I actually might have saw on this call, but um, <laughs> um, who was the, at the Boys and Girls Club at the time, mentioned that the Salt River community wanted to bring the Native Spirit program to their community. Uh, so of course, I wanted to help get that started. Um, Salt River is an urban-based reservation. The picture here shows a map of where the reservation is located. It's outlined in red. I'm also outlining it with a circle. Um, and it's sandwiched between Scottsdale, Tempe, and Mesa in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And so, you know, the Akimau Atam and the Pipash uh, traditionally inhabited this land that's currently occupied by, you know, the Phoenix metropolitan areas. So all the like, big irrigation systems you see there were, you know, set up by the Atam and the Pipash um, before Phoenix was Phoenix. And so I've been working to expand the Native Spirit program with Salt River ever since. And uh, the funding that I had um, was a pilot study. Um, you know, our aim was to determine the effectiveness of participation in the program. Um, but, so our hypothesis, you know, was uh, does participation in this after-school program, this culturally grounded after-school program, um, impact uh, you know self-esteem, cultural identity, resilience, and substance use? Um, when compared to those youth who don't, don't participate in the program. Uh, we use mixed methods to evaluate uh, with pre and post tests and also short interviews with some of the youth. And we worked with teens in seventh to 12th grade. Um, some of the findings and lessons learned. Um, our, our first pilot test was in 2019. Um, and we showed si significant changes in, in a positive way in cultural identity. Um, but our 2022 pilot test had little to no changes in resilience, cultural identity, or self-esteem. Um, although we did see some encouraging results in um, substance use, um, you know, youth who were using at the beginning of the program were using less at the end. Um, but uh, we didn't have enough power to see if that was statistically significant. Um, yeah, so we didn't see any um, little to no changes in 2022. And so, you know, it's a little anticlimactic, right? <laughs> um, maybe, but, you know, in research, it has also told us a lot. Um, you know, what happened between 2019 and 2022, COVID-19, you know, we had a global pandemic that shut down the community from April 2020 to February 2022. Um, because we're working on the after school program schedule, we had to cut it down seven sessions. And so, you know, it, it just may not be possible to see any changes in a seven week program that focuses on cultural identity, self esteem, and resilience. You know, those are typically like lifelong kind of lessons. And so, um, that's something we learned is we, you know, should try to have, make sure it's 10, at least 10 sessions every time. Um, also, the youth services department, you know, saw uh, low numbers of youth returning to programming in spring 2022. Um, so we had low participation um, and the community and the youth are still healing from COVID-19 losses. Um, there's been an increase in diagnosed behavioral health conditions since the pandemic. And, you know, as a community program and research study, um, you know, we need to continue to display like that 
patience and empathy and recognize that there are bigger things happening, you know, sometimes in our research projects. But um, overall, the people, youth who did participate were excited. Um, you know, we're still working. Um, we have our, our next steps include speaking with uh, cultural knowledge holders who have led sessions in the Native Spirit program for the past few years to see or get an idea of what their idea of a connection between cultural identity and health is. Um, and then also, you know, we're expand, we'll be expanding to other communities after presenting about this program and working with Salt River, the Youth Services Department, there have been other community after school programs who are interested in developing their own program. Um, and also we'll be looking at cultural identity measure, measurement and that's you know, more from our, our um, study side is how do you accurately and appropriately measure cultural identity? You know, is it a better, is it, would it be better for us to measure something like uh, cultural efficacy? And so that means that the youth know where to go to learn more about their culture. And that should, you know, could possibly be what we're focusing on. Um, and also looking into the uniqueness of urban-based reservations like Salt River, like uh, Pasquayaki. Um, you know, we have these reservations, lands that are right next to large urban areas. You know, how does that impact growth and cultural identity? And so that's something, some things we're looking into. Um, just a few, I know I'm kind of running out low on time, but <laughs> um, takeaway message, I think, you know, one of my biggest uh, things that I've, I've had to do is really reframe my struggles, you know, um, being patient with myself and my journey. And so I would kind of just like to reiterate that for, for, for people who are um, you know, going into grad school or even just life in general, um, you know, it's something that might seem like a failure at the, at the time might just be leading you down another path. And so also, you know, all you need is one advocate. Now that's kind of like my, what has been continuing to re like pop up every single time through my story is that, um, you know, I really don't know uh, where I would be and what I'd be doing today if I didn't have my mentors along the way. And so I'm excited to hopefully, you know, be that person for some of my future mentees. Um, any mentors in the room today, whether, you know, you're in academia or not, you can always be that person to nominate your mentees for awards, uh, be that person that they can trust, that, you know, that they feel comfortable telling you about what they think are failures. And you, you know, you might just have another door to open for them. And finally, um, that cultural connection is a form of healing. Um, it may come at different points in life for everyone, but it's good to have a base you can return to when you're feeling out of balance. Um, especially in higher, higher education can really feel like lonely and jarring at times. So I think it's especially um, important for students to make connections with their peers, um, you know, join that club or start your own. Um, you know, it'll more, be more than just like boosting your resume. It's like really it can be a healing process. Um, <clears throat> And finally, I, this is a quote from one of the teens over this last session. Um, I you know, mentioned earlier that I really felt like I was in the right place at the right time for this project. And I think having, going, having gone through that healing process uh, of my own, it has helped me to develop like a clear sense of focus on this project. And you know, I know that everyone takes in lessons at their own time. You know, especially working with teens, sometimes they aren't always listening because they're preoccupied with what's happening at school or at home. Um, but being able to provide this small link in the chain um, back to restoring health equity really makes me kind of energized and pumped for, for this work. Um, you know, our, our cultural identity, identity as Indigenous peoples is, is ever changing and for everyone too. It's not, you know, it's not static. It's a lifelong learning process. And um, that's kind of what I take away from this project every day. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I want to echo a comment that I saw earlier from, I believe it was Michelle, just kind of thanking you for sharing your vulnerability with us. And there's, I think there's tidbits of your experiences that resonate with a lot of us here in the audience. 
So thank you for that. I do want to open up the space now just for a general a Q and A session. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you might want to raise your hand first and then I'll call on you and then you can verbalize your question or um, you can also use the chat function for um, asking your questions as well. I think I did see a hand up earlier and let me give that person a chance. Oh, that was um, me, Carmelita. Yeah, Jesse. Jesse. Um, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I really appreciate your you uh, coming forward with your struggles as well as your experiences. Not very many people, young students. I work with students quite a lot, but not very many young students have have that opportunity as you have, especially coming from an educated family, such as your father being the lawyer mm -hmm. and your mother working in a, a, a professional field. Not very many young students do have that uh, experiences that you do. And I do appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I have one question for you. Um, are you working uh, your project? Is it for only Native American students or are you if students with multi race, for example, Native Americans with multi ethnicity or are you working with also helping other students um, that, that are biracial, for example, and I can give you my example. I do come from a family of very educated professionals. My kids are also professionals. They're half Asians and half white, Caucasian. I don't like to use the word white, but you know, the Caucasian. I noticed when, when they were in professional school, they would come to me and talk. When they were in high school, it wasn't that problem. When they were in undergraduate, it wasn't that much so, but in graduate, schools, but when they went to doctoral program, especially my youngest one is in law school now, she's a third year law student, and they would talk about when they have these little groups and pro, like, you know, how you, student groups, they find out when they try to be part of, they identify themselves, because I'm the, I'm an Asian mom, so they identify themselves as more of an Asian, because that's how I raise them, not more of I mean, they accept both the sides, but they found out that the Asian side groups would not include one to include them. They were not too Asian enough to be in that field, and they were not too white enough to be in this group. So it was constantly a dilemma that they had to face, not in undergraduate, not in grad school, but in professional schools, such as mm -hmm. doctoral schools, as well as professional schools, such as medical school, and as well as the law school. What do you have to say to those students, especially the younger generations who are two or three, um, you know, races, and they mm -hmm. struggle to identify which one, and they being rejected by the very people they feel like they are connected to. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's really unfortunate, especially, you know, in, in professional um, schools. And I, I'm, you know, wondering if that has to do with the competitiveness, um, you know, people feeling like they need to protect their space or something. But, you know, um, it's super unfortunate. Um, I, you know, tr I do work and our program is open to all, you know, indigenous youth. Um, a lot of indigenous youth are multiracial um, in the groups that I've been working with. And, you know, we, we really just try to reiterate to them throughout the objectives of our program is that, you know, you are an indigenous person. You're not, you know, a quarter of this, you know, you're not a percentage, you know what I mean? You are an indigenous person, you're a whole person um, and you belong. And so I think maybe if somebody is experiencing that kind of, um, uh, I guess, uh, not, you know, not kind of welcoming, not being welcomed by people of either groups, I would say maybe try to reach out and find and find people who you do, who, who do accept you for who you are. Um, you know, um, I feel like finding that, that group who, who do have that, that kind of background knowledge and that, you know, we are all you know, no matter what our genetic makeup is or our family line or whatever, mm. um, you know, you're an indigenous person, you know, you're, even if you're mixed, you're multiracial, you're, you, you can, you know. Well, that's what I'm saying. You, you have the indigenous in it. So students can be all mixed, uh, different race, different ethnicity or different thing, but they can claim their identity as an indigenous person. 
But if you're not an indigenous person, that was where my question, because you have all these programs and to help the students, no matter who they are, they could be a Mohawk and Irish, and they can still say I'm indigenous because I'm part Mohawk. So they can come claim that way. But what happens is when you have like an Asian and a Caucasian, they don't have that luxury of saying, can I be in the Asian group? Just like mm -hmm. the natives can have it. They can be multi-race, but they can still claim even if they are 148th percent of native identity, they can still say, like they can have that comfort area that they can go to. Um, that's what I, my question was. But I understand your project. I appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate that you're helping all our native brothers and sisters, which is good, but I always feel bad for those who are not. Thank you for, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, I, I feel like that is like, you know, a big struggle that's happening. And I, the only thing I could say is, you know, it's kind of hard being like the one, the person to start it, but maybe they could be the person who is starting up this group, you know, of, um, you know, of, of like-minded kind of people who they can have talk about this like multiracial kind of struggles with. And so, you know, if it is your, your child, you know, maybe they could be the one to start, start that up if it doesn't exist at their institution that they're at. Thank you. But I don't think they will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Jesse. I see hand up by, uh, from Serene and then Tamara. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Um, <clears throat> it's so cool to hear to hear this. So Amanda's on my dissertation committee, full disclosure. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I'm so moved by everything you said and to hear about your journey, because um, <laughs> I feel like a lot of times it's the other way around. Um, but I just, I kept thinking about when I met you in Supai years ago, and um, you have just always seemed um, so genuine and, um, and so easy to work with. And, um, so thank you so much for sharing your story. And, um, at my defense, I was totally thinking how much I would love to be meeting with you in particular more. And, um, as you're talking about, you know, being a mentor, I definitely consider you as one of mine and really look forward to strengthening that. So, um, I'm really glad I was able to come today and, and hear everything you said. So thanks. Thank you. Hugs. <laughs> and then Tamara. Hi, Amanda. It's always so great to hear your story and to hear <laughs> the evolution of the Native Spirit curriculum. And I can certainly say that I'm not in the youth development field no more. I'm in the early baby field now, <laughs> but um, early childhood field. But I must say that uh, speaking from the youth development um, professional, I guess, I, I really want to say that it was just so amazing to have you in Peach Springs as well as in Salt River uh, doing what you're doing, creating an, a program that's so, so needed. Uh, for our youth and uh, certainly for communities that really need it. Um, within the Boys and Girls Club uh, field, it's very uh, having cultural resiliency programs just for uh, the youth that you serve is rare. And to be able to have you come and to be able to work with the community as a partner and to request even permission to be in the community was huge in helping to establish our own legitimacy as a youth development agency working to support youth in the community. Um, so I just want to, you know, thank you and applaud you for all the tremendous work that you've done, for all the care and attention that you and your team and uh, partners have been able to establish uh, in, in ensuring that we're providing the very best for, for our youth. Um, I think Native communities in general have been approached in a far different way that might not have been um, as, as, um, as ethical. <laughs> and so that's why there's been quite a lot of, um, bit, a lot of distrust, right? And so for you to be able to do so in the manner that you did speaks volumes. 
um, and certainly also being able to create a curriculum that allows the community itself to have those cultural knowledge keepers to come in and to be able to share what they want to share with the youth uh, builds this um, relationship um, built out of that kinship um, that is definitely something that's ancestral and part of our inherent indigenous culture. And so to be able to make that bridge and to be that um, cultural connector uh, is definitely great. And I, you know, and I just curious as far as, I mean, I saw the impact that Native Spirit had on the kids in Hualapai. And I left in 2019 when the program was started in Salt River. So I'm curious like what the difference has been in working with youth who were younger, because I think in Peach you worked with, with more of the elementary school kids versus working um, and applying the curriculum with, with the teens? Yeah, you know, there are different developmental stages, obviously. And um, even within, you know, Salt River, like we work with seventh grade to 12th grade, and there are huge changes that happen within that time period. Um, and so, you know, we had to change the curriculum a little bit. Um, so our activities were kind of mirrored um, for an older, um, older youth, you know, seventh to 12th grade. Um, we were able to, you know, do activities a little bit longer because, you know, the kind of attention span is a little bit longer at that time. Um, I think we're able to have some of those like a little bit more in-depth conversations. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about like, you know, gender roles and belonging in the community, um, no matter, you know, where you're from kind of thing. Um, and it's, you know, I've been able to get a little bit more in depth in like inter interviews with the teens than with like nine to 11 year old uh, kids, you know, and so they can a little bit more clearly express um, how the program has impacted them. Um, and so just getting a little bit more in depth about how they're how they're feeling, um, you know, and that kind of changes too from a seventh grade student through a 12th grade student. Um, and yeah, I think that it's, it's such like a hard time in their lives as a, you know, in middle school, it's so awkward, but, <laughs> um, um, and so I, I, I think, you know, our, our messaging and the way that they connect with the cultural knowledge holders is different too. Like they start to, you know, see them as somebody that they could reach out to on their own. Um, and so I, I do think this like seventh to 12th grade um, age group is, is, has worked out really nicely. Thanks, Tamara. Wonderful. I just want to let you know that we are at, at about 1250 and we have time for three questions. Um, the first of which is from Hoseva. And I don't know, Hoseva, do you want to do you want to speak it out loud or do you want me to do to, to read it? Um, yeah, I could read it. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, yes, I just had a question for Dr. Hunter about the Native Spirit Program. Um, when you developed the program, did you have in mind of having any kind of culturally responsive learning or teaching or schooling or anything in that regard um, when you implemented the program? And when you did, did you utilize it along the lines of, um, you know, along the faculty or the facilitators? Yeah. That was just my right. main question. Thank yeah, you. so the good thing about our, you know, the the one thing, you know, one thing about our program is it's an after school program. And so we are um, not officially affiliated with the schools, which allows us a little bit more freedom um, to, you know, in our curriculum, in our timing of activities. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, with Wallapai and then with Salt River, before we started the, the program, you know, we met with, you know, cultural resources department, elders in the community, um, boys and girls club staff, after school club staff, um, to figure out like what 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 are the cultural values here in this community that need to be passed down to the youth, um, and what kind of activities cultural activities are kind of aligned with those values, and that's kind of what our or the structure of our curriculum is. It's you know each session is based on a cultural value that was decided by our community advisory board, um, cultural knowledge holders, and um, and so it's a little bit separate. Um, I think it is 
Um, it can be a little, but there are challenges with working in the after school space instead of the, you know, in within the schools, um, you know, including you, you have a lot of times if you work in schools, you know, you have the students there. They're like, you know, they're, they're already there. Um, after school program, it's, it's drop in, they don't have to attend. And so, you know, it kind of makes that a little bit more challenging as you do have to make sure that it's also like engaging that they're want, gonna wanna come back. Um, and so we did kind of have, I think, mirror a little bit with, with maybe some of the tactics of culturally responsive schooling, but maybe with a little bit more like freedom in the after school space. Great, thank you. Oh, and congrats, Hosaba. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, Carmen, you did. Darn it, I almost went through the whole thing without you having to say <laughs> that. Um, we have one more question. And that one is from Laura. So take it away, Laura. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hunter, while I was listening to your talk and you were explaining your pathway, I appreciated so much that you shared about your struggles early on in graduate school. Um, and so I'm a white advisor of graduate students, and I've had sort of a mix of different ethnicities, but no Native American students yet. My question is, if you think back to those earliest years in graduate school, what advice or what what suggestions would you have for white advisors or departments that are majority white that would help them to support the mental well being of native students or or I guess all students, but particularly mm -hmm. native students. Yeah, and if uh, we have any other native grad students feel free to jump in if you have any suggestions, but. Um, I think finding people on campus, especially if you're here at NAU. Um, there are a lot of good resources and awesome native, like native aunties here <laughs> on campus, you know, within, um, um, who, you know, if it's not their role, um, you know, or if it is their role, then that could be something that they can, you know, kind of be that person who, you know, where you can direct if they're having, having, um, you know, struggling. But I think that it really helps to express interest and also empathy. Um, I think sometimes, you know, as an, I, I've, you know, taught classes before where I've had students who were turning things in late constantly or who, you know, weren't showing up to class and their grades were suffering. And without me like reaching out, I would have never known that, you know, I would just think that they're like being lazy or they don't care. Um, when in reality, like, you know, for me, it was because of this thing that I was, you know, going through um, at the time. Um, and so, for for me, with other like if I've had students who do that, I like have reached out to them and asked them if they're okay and what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so I think that just even just starting establishing that kind of um, conversation is really kind of expresses or um, communicates that you care. Um, is there anything that a that a department can do if it wants to make the whole department a more welcoming environment? where it's okay to talk about mental health struggles? Yeah, um, for as far as like indigenous students, I would say like, you know, higher, higher um, native faculty would be awesome. Um, and then uh, within a department, I think maybe within a department having those conversations with each other so everybody's on the same page. You know, you might have one instructor who's like, a hard ass who's not reaching out to people. And then you might have one who is and so, you know, people might try to avoid that one person or not talk to them about anything that's going on in their lives. Um, so I think getting on the same page as a department would probably be really helpful. And, um, you know, trying to figure out ways that, that you can be more welcoming as a department for students. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, those were really great questions. And so as we begin to wrap up, um, bear with me while I, Put my slides back up. There'd be a smoother way to do this. <laughs> okay, there we go. So again, I wanna thank you very much ahead, um, to Amanda for being our guest presenter for the Fairness First X series talk. And if you wanna connect with Amanda, later posing a question, or maybe you want to learn more about the research that she does, or even seek her out as 
a potential mentor, you can reach out to her via her email address, which is amu22 at nau.edu. And so this is our very last slide. Please uh, let us know how you felt about today's presentation, um, the content, um, rating the, the event overall. So you can either use your phone to scan that QR code. It will take you to um, a survey that should take about a minute and a half to maybe two minutes to um, complete, or you can go to that URL and it'll take you to um, a screen that looks just like the one that I'm holding up on my end. And again, I wanna thank you so much for being a participant to today's Fairness First X Talk, and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I know you have to leave soon, Amanda. Do you want to do the debrief at a different time? Um, um, possibly. Um, well, yeah, I don't know. Um, what are what should we talk about? <laughs> oh, just in general.